Good evening and welcome to our Tuesday evening live Bible study. I'm Andrew Womack and I've got Carrie Pickett here with me. She's a blessing and uh, she's the vice president of our Karis Bible College and Andrew Womack Ministries, her and her husband, and they just do a lot of good stuff for us. <laughs> we just got back from Washington, D.C. and held meetings there with uh, Tony Cook. He was a guest speaker with me and it was really good. I think people got ministered to and we saw people healed. We saw, uh, I forget the exact numbers now, but it was over 120 that were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And I think yep. there was five or six that were born again. You know, 120 people turned the world upside down when they got baptized That's in right. the Holy Ghost. Well, watch out. <laughs> in the upper room. And so praise God, man, we could see some awesome things happen. So before I get into the Bible study tonight, I want Carrie to share some things with you. We got a giveaway. We've got things that you can participate in. And so Carrie will share all that with you. Yeah. So welcome to Tuesday Night Live Bible Study. It is live. And so we do some things that if this is something you are not accustomed to, well, we're really excited that you are joining us. And so what we do during our live Bible study is that we're going to, Andrew's going to share about 30 minutes, and then we're going to go to the end where we're going to do question and answers. And so this is whatever form you're watching on, go down to that chat section and put in your questions. And we'll take as much time uh, that we can here at the end to answer as many questions as possible. And whatever questions we don't get to, what we also do during the week, because it's not just Tuesday Live Bible Study, we have Live Bible Study Monday through Friday. And so every day of the week, we have the Bible Study different times, so it works great with your schedules. Mondays and Fridays, we have a 10 o'clock in the morning. Tuesdays and Thursdays, like tonight at uh, 6 p.m., and then Wednesday morning at 7 in the morning. So it works with all of your schedules, and especially for our international uh, that are watching, it works for you guys as well. And so what you can do is uh, send in your questions on any of those days, not just with Andrew teaching normally on Tuesday nights, unless he's traveling. Uh, we also have all of our great Karis Bible College instructors, and they share some powerful truths, and we gather questions that that we aren't able to get through during those times. And we have a roundup every Tuesday afternoon. So if you have not ever uh, signed up for our Andrew Womack Ministries Facebook, go to that page, hit like, and then those live questions, we take another time to answer more questions. And this is such a blessing to people because a lot of people have questions about the Word of God, but they don't have somebody they can go to and ask. And so we're really excited to be able to answer these questions. Another thing that we do for live Bible study is 20 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we have prayer ministers available to you. And they they would love to pray with you, whatever you're going through. Uh, and you say, I just need encouragement. I need someone to agree with me uh, on the word of God. They would love to do that. And so call in. Our number there is on the screen. Again, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. On Tuesday, Bible study also, whoever is minister, whether it's Andrew or another guest minister, we take those Bible study notes and we give notes out every week. And this is a Tuesday night Bible study. So what you can do is sign up for those Bible study notes at awmi.net slash Bible study. And this gives you an opportunity to go over the verses. Sometimes Andrew, different speakers, they have so many verses and maybe you're driving or cooking or cleaning or doing something with the kids and you're not able to write this stuff down. Well, you want to get these Bible study notes. They're going to be a great blessing to you. So sign up for that. And when you do, we have a free drawing every week because we always have a product that we give away. And this week, it's Spirit, Soul, and Body. Guys, I'm telling you, Spirit, Soul, and Body is amazing. My copy is so highlighted, you can barely read the words anymore. <laughs> it is excellent. And so I'm going to encourage you to sign up for those Bible study notes. And maybe you're saying, I've already signed up for the Bible study notes, and I, but I really want this. Uh, please call into that helpline because when you call them, not only do you get prayer, you can also ask them about our multitudes of products from Andrew and our other speakers and teachers and guest ministers. We have so much material that's going to bless you and help you in your growth process. So last week we had uh, Life Foundations we gave away because I had taught last week. And so Life Foundations, that's the book Mike and I wrote. So uh, Miguel 
Marconi, you won that. So Miguel, we're going to get that out to you. So I know you're going to be super blessed. And then lastly, we have a couple amazing things coming up here at Karis Bible College, our summer family Bible conference. Guys, I'm telling you, you want to come to Colorado. It's going to be green and beautiful because it's still snowing. We're still getting moisture. I was just going to say, <laughs> some people are looking at the fire over <laughs> Carrie's shoulder and thinking, what do you have a fire on, on May the 24th? Saturday, it snowed what, 15 it, inches? Uh, 15 to 18, depending on where you are. 15 to 18 and inches. And it snowed again today. Yes, it snowed Which again the, today. <laughs> but the good news is, I'm not trying to scare you off from coming to Colorado no. because it was beautiful, but it's been warm enough that the snow didn't Shh. stick on the roads. No, so, so everything is green, yeah, was, yeah, beautiful. beautiful. The, the temperature is awesome. We just got back from Washington. The kids walked out and said, Mom, what's wrong with the air? And I'm like, that's called humidity. So please come to Colorado. You would love it. And they're it. predicting that tomorrow, I think, in Woodland Park, it's going to be up to about 60 or something like that. <laughs> so all of the snow will be gone in a day or so. But... There's a reason why we have a fire going. That's right. And so our children's ministry and youth ministry that we do during the Summer Family Bible Conference, this is something special we do so that families can come and go to the morning sessions while the parents are listening to the word. Teenagers and kids are getting great word listening to that. And so I'm going to encourage you, uh, come out, make it uh, make it an opportunity uh, to listen to the word together as a family. Uh, we've had whole families that got spirit-filled, baptized together. It's just been really, really special. Also, what we have is July 3rd and July 4th, we have our patriotic uh, production in God We Trust. It is so powerful. So it would be a great uh, time to bring the family, watch that, and then stay for the conference. And so uh, if you want to know more about that, go to awmi.net slash events, and you can register for the conference. It's a free conference, uh, so you can bring everybody out to it. We would love to see you here. Is your family going to be in this one? In God We Trust, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, Miss Jamie and I are the cranky, yeah, snotty, so religious well. ladies. You really? I did it so well because it's so out of character. No, I, I <laughs> thought it was because it was so natural. <laughs> but you and Jamie go, and uh, Sharon Rich, boy, it's just really something the way yes. it's all acting. <laughs> Every church has those three ladies, and That's we, right. we do it. <laughs> all right, so I want to share with you from Philemon, chapter 1. There's only one chapter in Philemon. And these verses became a real foundational truth for me when I first got uh, really turned on to the Lord. Because, you know, I grew up, uh, me, I got born again when I was eight years old. Carrie, you also got born again at eight, didn't you? It's really young. I was born again at a six and spirit filled at seven. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So anyway, we both got born again at a real young age and I knew the Lord, but I didn't really know the Lord. I didn't know who He was. And I thought that uh, God had all of this power, but I had to do things in order to get it. Mm -hmm. And I thought that God was always, you know, the healing, the victory, joy, peace, everything was coming from the outside in. And these verses right here just kind of summarize some of the foundational truths that God showed me that really turned my life around. So let me read some of this Philemon. Chapter 1, it's Paul writing to Philemon, who is a friend of his. And Philemon had a slave named Onesimus that had run away from him. And uh, Philemon lived in Colossae, if I'm not mistaken, which is where Paul ministered at one time. But when Onesimus ran away, he ran away to Rome. And he met Paul in Rome. And Paul led him to the Lord. And he got born again. And so Paul told Onesimus to go back to Philemon and submit himself to him. And uh, there was a potential that he could have been punished. He, he may have stolen some stuff. Uh, we don't know. And uh, so Paul wrote a letter to basically recommend Onesimus back to Philemon. And so here is the beginning of his letter to Philemon. And he said in Philemon chapter 1, verse 3, he says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers, um, hearing of thy love and faith, which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and towards all saints. And here's the verse that really ministered to me, that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. 
good. And so again, I was raised with this concept that God was all powerful and God could do anything, but he hadn't done anything yet. And that you had to petition him and basically depending on how sincere you were, how much faith you had and on and on all the criteria goes that God would respond to you and then move and do something. But this said that the communication of your faith, the word communication is what I'm doing right now. I'm communicating things with you that are in my heart and I'm communicating them to you. So I, you could say the transfer or the release of what you, of your faith would become effectual. That means it begins to start working. How? It's not by your holiness. It's not by you earning. It's not by you doing enough. It's not by all of these things. You know, when I got born again, I went to the Baptist church and they used to have this little um, poem that they would quote. And it says, Mary had a little lamb. It would have been a sheep, but it joined the Baptist church and died from lack of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, basically that kind of summarized. It was just, man, you get saved and then you just work yourself to the bone and you had to do all of these things to please God. They didn't have the concept of being accepted in Christ. It yeah. was accepted based on you were in you. Mm. And you know, Carrie and I have been visiting. She's starting to make television programs. She's yeah. doing awesome. She's going to put them on our Gospel Truth TV. Mm. And she was teaching on the love of God, which is hard to teach on because people think, oh, I know that. Mm -hmm. But no, we don't know that. What most of us relate mm. God's love to what we've done. done. Uh, what was it that you were saying? What you have to... Well, just that if we do the because, whole thing, if God, you know, uh, I love you if, I love you when, I love you because that's human type yeah. of love. And so there's conditions where God, praise God, doesn't have those, I love you when you pray, I love you if you fast, I love you because you serve me. God loves us because He is love. And that's awesome. Amen. That was really, really good. And see, that was a concept that I had. Mm -hmm. And this was a brand new concept that the thing that really made my faith work wasn't something I did to get God to respond to me, but God had already done it. Mm -hmm. It was already in me. And this is what literally transformed my life. Um, Carrie mentioned that book on spirit, soul, and body that we're giving away tonight. And did you know that that, that is the revelation that just rev revolutionized everything because I found out that when I got born again, I was already given everything in Christ Jesus. And there's too many scriptures on this for me to quote. I'd have to go through a, a real long teaching, but Colossians chapter nine, verse, uh, Colossians two verses nine and 10 says that in Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And then verse 10, and you are complete in him. And then 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. It didn't say all things are becoming new or can become new. It says it's already a done deal. And I couldn't see that in my physical body. I couldn't see it in my mental, emotional part of me. I had to learn that in the spirit, I'm already complete. And another verse that goes with that is 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, where it says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as He is, speaking of Jesus, so are we in this world, not so are we going to be in the next world. You know, the church I was raised in, it was always about when we all get to heaven, what a day that would be. And it was all about there's going to be victory and we'll be healed in heaven and we'll have joy in heaven. But man, it was all in the sweet by and by. There was nothing good in the rough now and now. You were just <laughs> saved and stuck and had to hold on. And so this was a brand new concept to think that God has already placed all of this in us. Mm -hmm. And it's not a matter of getting God to give us more. It's a matter of discovering what we have and then learning how to release it. You know, I did a, uh, a conference in Nice, France today. I did it by Zoom. Mm -hmm. Praise God, there was no, z uh, no jet lag. Jet lag. <laughs> Man, it was awesome. And anyway, this is what I taught on, and I was teaching about how that in ground, God put everything that we would ever need. You know, that's a statement that most people, when I say that, it goes right over their head and they don't think about it. But did you know that God is the one who thought through everything, and He's the one that made sand so that you can heat it and turn it into glass. 
something that you can see through. God is the one who made it so that certain minerals can be melted down and combined together and make steel and tempered steel and all of this. God is the one who, uh, you know, put everything. Another way of saying this is everything that is above the ground now was originally in the ground. Mm -hmm. God anticipated everything that we will ever need and He's already provided it. It's in dirt, but it has to have a seed to activate it. And this is basically what the Lord was showing me, that everything that I will ever need in the rest of my Christian life has already been placed on the inside of me when I got born again. I have the same spirit that raised Jesus Christ from the dead as Jesus is, so am I in this world, but it's in that form like dirt. There, there's everything that we'll ever need in dirt, but it has to have a word to quicken it and to be the catalyst that makes those things grow and come out of the ground. Likewise, you've got everything in Christ that you need, but it has to be activated when you begin to start taking God's Word and putting it in your life. And so this is one of the things that just literally transformed my life, that I didn't have to go get something new. It was rather discovering what I already had. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, this has just transformed my life. And here I am 54 years after that encounter with the Lord. And you know what? I'm still discovering. Man, I was studying the Word this morning and just getting some awesome, awesome revelation out of it. And it's like, you know, going into a mine or something and you hit this, uh, you know, this vein of gold and you mine it, but there's just, there's always more. You just have to keep digging. You have to keep looking. And I'm telling you that whatever it is that you need tonight, it's already in you. And the thing that makes it work, the thing that makes your faith become effectual is just acknowledging what you already have. You know, the word acknowledge is really uh, unique because it, it's not talking about getting something. You can't acknowledge something that you don't already have. So it's implied in there that you've already got it. And I'm telling you that you've already got it. Mm. Matter of fact, in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul prays a prayer starting in verse 14 through the end of the chapter. Yeah. And he prays that the eyes of your understanding, and the word for understanding there is the Greek word dianoia, and it means deep thought. Not just surface level thought, but deep thought. In other mm. words, you have to meditate and think about it and really let this, uh, you know, sink in on you. But he prayed that the eyes of your understanding, your deep thought would be enlightened so that you could see the hope of your calling and what is the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And then the next verse says, according to the power, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in the heavenly places. What those verses are saying is he's wanting you to see what you already have. It's the same power mm -hmm. that was used to raise Jesus Christ from the dead. And did you know that the average Christian doesn't understand this? The average Christian thinks that somehow or another we've been touched by God. We may have a little bit of power and authority, but most people wouldn't put themselves in the same category as Jesus. They would think that that's nearly blasphemy, that you're, it's arrogance, you're exalting yourself. But when you got born again, it was the spirit of His Son that was sent into your heart, crying, Abba, Father, Galatians 4, 6. And Romans chapter 8, verse 9 says, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. When you got born again, you didn't get just a little bit of God, a little bit of power or authority. You literally had God Himself come live on the inside of you in His fullness. He can't come in partially. Yeah. You've got the fullness, again, Colossians mm -hmm. 2.10, the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Jesus and you are complete in Him. You have the fullness of God in you, but it has to be released. How is it released? By acknowledging what you already have. So he's praying that your eyes would be open to see the power that you have, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. You've got raising from the dead power mm -hmm. on the inside of you. You know, the devil 
uh, resisted the resurrection of Jesus with everything he had. He threw all of his power and all of his authority against it because this was the focal point. If Jesus rose from the dead and conquered death and conquered the devil, Satan's days were numbered. And so he threw everything that he had against it and he could not stop Jesus from being raised from the dead. So that was the greatest demonstration of God's power that the world has ever seen. You know, when God created the heavens and the earth, there wasn't any devil that was resisting him. So there was really no resistance. But when he raised Jesus from the dead, Satan put his whole kingdom, every demon in hell was there to stop that, and they couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a church in uh, Colorado Springs that came up with this uh, production called The Thorn. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see that? Yeah, years ago. It was really good. And anyway, one of the things I liked about it, they had a person that personified the devil. And every time, you know, the scribes and Pharisees were saying, crucify him, this person dressed in black who was the devil was always the one that was the instigator. So it was very obvious throughout the entire play that this person was, uh, you know, the devil instigating all of these things. And so at the resurrection, they showed the tomb and the tomb was sealed and it had this stone rolled over it and you had this person that played the devil that was dressed and he was putting all of his force against it trying to hold the tomb uh, you know sealed and all of a sudden there was this huge explosion and smoke and you couldn't see anything mm -hmm. for a while and when it cleared you could see this guy that played the devil underneath the stone. The stone was on top of him and <laughs> Jesus was standing on the stone like this. And it was just a great way of characterizing how that Good. Satan threw everything he had mm -hmm. against this. And yet the power that raised Jesus from the dead was greater than all of the force mm -hmm. of the devil. And this is the same power that you and I have inside of us. And I know that there's some of you right now that you're thinking, I don't have any power. You're fighting sickness or you're fighting depression, loneliness, fear, uh, people, all kinds of things. And you're just thinking, I don't have any power to do anything. The truth is you already have, according to Ephesians chapter uh, 1, verses 14 through the end of the chapter, you ought to go read those verses yourself. You already have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead, not only in quality, but in quantity. Mm -hmm. You have the exact same power, but you've got to acknowledge it. And this is where we're missing it. And these verses out of Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, I remember in the beginning when God started showing me this, I would just say this over and over and over. And I would pray, oh God, I pray that the communication of my faith would become effectual by acknowledging the things that you've already put on the inside of me. I would pray that. And also I'd pray that prayer that we were using in Ephesians chapter 1 where he prays that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened. Then there's another prayer that I prayed in Ephesians chapter 3 where he's prayed that God would dwell in your hearts by faith that you might be able to comprehend with all saints the height, the depth, the length, and the breadth and to know the love of God which passes knowledge. You know, that sounds like a contradiction. If it passes knowledge, how can you know it? It's talking about that you would experience it, that which passes just mere intellectual knowledge. And then it says that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Your spirit is already filled with the same resurrection power of God that it took to raise Jesus from the dead. But you've got to get it out of your spirit, into your mind. You've got to acknowledge it and renew your mind with that. And once you do, well, then you need to experience that supernatural life-giving power in your physical body. So man, this just transformed my life. Amen. And I want to share with you that regardless of what you're fighting, regardless of what your needs are, the power of God is not out in heaven someplace that you've got to do something to pray it down. You know, this is exactly what Paul was saying in Romans chapter 10. In the first part of that chapter, he says, the, you know, what do we have to say? It's the word of faith which we preach. You don't have to ascend into heaven because Christ has already come down from heaven. You don't have to go down to hell and pay for your own sins and suffer punishment for all these things because Christ has already been there. But it's just simply the word of faith with which we preach that if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. 
Jesus has already paid for everything. He's already provided everything. Everything that you will ever need is already in you if you are born again. Mm -hmm. It's already there, but you've got to acknowledge it. Yeah. You know, another passage of Scripture goes right along with this is Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. Christ in you, the hope of glory. He's already in you. And then in chapter 2, he begins to talk about, I pray that nobody deceive you with enticing words and draw you away from this simplicity. And then he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. And so he's saying, Don't let anybody steal this knowledge from you. It's not that you have to get God to do something new. It's not that you've got to perform and God responds to you. When you got born again, God gave everything to you that you will ever need for the rest of your Christian life. Yeah. The rest of your Christian life is renewing your mind to what you already have. Or in the vernacular, uh, Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, just acknowledging every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And you know, Carrie, when the Lord first spoke that to me, I honestly didn't know that there was any good thing in me. Mm. I'd been taught, you know, Romans chapter 7 says that in me, that is in my flesh, there dwells no good thing. Paul said that, and I was aware of that, but I left out that parenthetical phrase. If Paul would have just said that in me, there dwells no good thing, that would have been incorrect mm -hmm. because he had Christ living in him. But he says in me, and then he qualified it by saying that is in my flesh. That's talking about just yeah. your physical yeah. body, your mental and emotional part. There isn't any good thing in you there, but in your born again spirit, you have the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in okay. you bodily. And the victory in the Christian mm -hmm. life is focused on who you are in Christ and not your flesh, not the things that you've done wrong, not this mindset that you've got to earn all these things, but just resting in the Lord and acknowledging that you've already got mm -hmm. everything. It's already done. That's good. And so, man, that's real quick. That's a summary of some things that the Lord showed me. But I tell you, I'd, I'd encourage many of you to take Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, and just pray that. God, show me. Show me the good things that I have in Christ so that my faith could become effectual, so that it could begin that's to good. work, and then I could start seeing the power of God work in my life. Mm -hmm. This verse was really important to me when I was in Russia. Because here I was trying to be a missionary and I was trying to share my faith and I was trying to teach and I just, the devil was always telling me that I wasn't good enough and all of that. We talked about this last Bible study, but it was always telling me what I wasn't. And when I realized all the good things I had in Christ, yeah. the attention became about Christ versus me. And then how I preached and taught, it came out of a relationship versus out of me trying to be this perfect communicator. And this really set me free. Yeah, and you know, the scripture says in Revelation 12 that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. So yeah. he is always there pointing out what you're doing wrong. You know, we've had a lot of people here locally criticize me and they just are always pointing out things that I'm saying and doing. And sad to say, a lot of the times they're right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't do everything right. And if you get to where you are looking at everything you're doing wrong uh -huh. and feeling like you've got to do it all right before God can ever use you, you'll never get used. You'll just actually disqualify yourself and say, well, God can use someone else. And yeah. I, I'm always telling the students that, um, you know, because they're always saying, well, how can I evangelize better and things like that. And some people use this as an evangelism verse solely, like if you want to become effective in your communication, I always tell people, if you can get so full of what understanding what you have in Christ and just how big He is within you, then when you look at people, when you look at friends and family and coworkers and whoever's around you, then you're like, I can't imagine them not having what I have, not knowing what I know. And that's what a real relationship with God, knowing mm -hmm. who He is inside of you, then it just, it comes out of you. It's a river of life versus like, I've got to, you know, talk to 10 people today type of thing. And, you know, I've, I've been coaching uh, Carrie right before this Bible study about her TV program. And, man, it's anointed. She did a great job. Yeah. But one of the things I was telling her is 
that you have a desire to do everything perfectly <laughs> and that you want to say everything just right. And I have never said everything just right in my whole life. And if you wait and, and if you're focused on the things that you don't do instead of the things that you do, yeah. then you'll never minister. And so I was just sharing with her that, you know, you, you never do everything perfectly, but you focus on the good. good. Yeah. When God created the heavens yeah. and the earth, He saw the light that it was good, and He separated the light from the darkness. He didn't focus on the darkness. He focused on the light that He mm -hmm. made. You've got to focus on the good things that are good. in you in Christ and not all of the things that still need to be worked on. Yeah. That's this awesome. is good. Well, we got some great questions. So let me ask this. So uh, uh, one of our guests on email had said this. Uh, how do we learn to stop listening to negative thoughts as if they were our own? Sometimes there are so many thoughts in my head. It's overwhelming and makes me anxious. The answer to that is the Word of God. Mm -hmm. The Word of God, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, is quick. It means alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and joint and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So the soul and spirit, the soul is your thoughts, your mental, emotional part. The spirit is the born again part of you. Mm -hmm. And the spirit will only think and act and entertain thoughts that are consistent with the Word of God. Anytime you have a thought that's contrary to God's Word, then you just know that that's the flesh, yep. that's the devil, Amen. and you reject it. But if you don't know the Word of God, you won't be able to divide asunder between these things. Yeah. Matter of fact, that very terminology in Hebrews 4.12, it says the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, implying that it's really hard to distinguish between the soul and the spirit. And the mm -hmm. only thing that can really do it is the sharp Word of God. You can't just sit there and in your own self evaluate things. You have to know what God's Word says. You know, I was uh, right after Jamie and I got married, uh, my daddy-in-law, and he didn't like me at all at first. We had a rough time. <laughs> we wound up being great friends before he died. But he didn't like me at all. But he asked me to pray over the meal. And I had this blasphemous thought come through my mind that I don't know that I'd ever thought in my, at that time I was 23 or 24 years old, I don't know that I had ever thought it in my life. It just came out of left field. And it was so perverse and so weird that I said, I know that's not me. Yeah. That had to be the devil. And so it was easy, see, to recognize that that's not me. I rebuked this thought mm -hmm. in the name of Jesus. But when it's, when it's just a little bit off, and it's not so obvious. Like when the devil comes at you and he's not wearing a red suit and horns and a pitchfork <laughs> and he's dressed as an angel of light, how do you discern that? The Word of God is the only thing yeah. that can divide asunder between those thoughts. So that's the way that you have to do it. And I can promise you if you're having a hard time keeping your thoughts stayed upon the Lord, it's because you're entertaining, you're listening to so much of this confusion and junk and noise that the world has to offer. You need to get to where you just are focused on God's Word. Yeah. So Norma asked this on chat, says, how do I deal with traditional Christian friends thinking I'm crazy with all this I'm already healed confessions when they still see me with symptoms? At this point, I just try to steer clear of them because I don't want any unbelief in my life. Well, the scripture that comes to mind is Romans chapter 3, verse 4, where it says, yea, let God be true and every man a liar. Mm -hmm. Liar. You just have to get to a place to where God's Word is so real to you, it's so important, it has so much authority in your life that it doesn't matter what anybody mm -hmm. else says. And I tell you, you don't get there instantly. I believe that the Lord created us for fellowship. Yeah. And there's just something inside of every person that longs to be liked and accepted. Anybody who likes rejection, something's wrong with you. <laughs> I don't like rejection, but I've learned that I want God's acceptance more than I want any person's acceptance. And so I've just had to make a choice and say, God, if I know that I'm doing what you told me to do, I'm going to cast my care about all the people who reject me and dislike me over on you, and I'm not going to worry about it. And so it's a choice that you have to make. And the only way I know how to do it is just to get like Romans 3, 4, let God be true mm -hmm. 
-hmm. and every man a liar. If God's for me, who can be against me? And you cast your care about it on the Lord and let His acceptance compensate for any rejection you get from other people. That's good. So we have another uh, guest on email said this, how do we stay focused on the good things when we are surrounded by so much negativity in these end times? The answer is God's Word again. Amen. Everything, you know, your mind is like a magnifying glass or a set of binoculars. And whatever you focus your attention upon, it just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And the sad fact is most of us are plugged into this world. And with our technology that we have today, yeah. like our phones, I've seen a statistic that the average person spends between four and five hours a day on their phones. Yeah. Reading emails, looking at social media, checking the news. If you spend four to five hours a day mm -hmm. listening to all of the sewage of this world as it flows through, and then you counter it with a 10 minute or a 15 minute devotion, and there's a lot of people that don't even have that. Yeah. I guarantee you, you're gonna be negative and you're gonna have all of this criticism bother you. So it's not just a matter of spending quality time with the Lord, you've got to spend quantity time. Yeah. Now, I will admit this, you can't go around driving your car with your Bible <laughs> no. open and reading it. That's dangerous. <laughs> yeah. You can't go to work and be reading. But you know what you can do? You can take scriptures. Like today, I was studying Psalms chapter 19, and man, it the, every verse of that Psalm just blessed me so much. I have spent all day long just thinking about the heavens declare the glory of God. That word mm -hmm. declare in the Hebrew means to score with the mark. God is crying out through creation to us. And I've been thinking about this all day long. And yet I've done a lot of other things. I've had a, a conference in France. I've had a meeting with our, my executive team. I've been doing a lot of things, but mm -hmm. I have been thinking on what the Word says. So I've been in the Word. I've been focused on the Word, even though I was doing other things. And some people think, well, you can't do that. I, you can go to work and worry all day long. If you have a financial problem, yep. you can go to work, and yet the whole day you're thinking about, man, how am I going to pay this bill? How am I going to get through this? Your thoughts are never off of the finances, and yet you're able to still do your job. Did you know the same part of you that worries is the same part of you that meditates on the Word of God. You can train yourself to where you keep your attention on the Word of God. And 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5 says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down of imaginations, mm -hmm. and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought under the obedience of Christ. So that verse says that you can bring every thought yeah. in under control and to obedience to Christ. So you can do it. It just it's like a muscle. You got to exercise it. it. Takes a while. Yeah. So that kind of goes along. Uh, Rocco asked this on chat. Says, how do you keep your relationship with God alive and vibrant and always producing not just stagnant religious calisthenics? Again, it goes back to the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Man, I tell you, God's Word's the answer to everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I was again reading in Psalms today, and I mentioned Psalms chapter 19, but I read actually from Psalms, I think it was chapter mm -hmm. 6 all the way through 23. And I, as I was studying, it just was talking about the entrance of your words. This is in Psalms 19, I believe, verse 9. The entrance of your Word gives light. It gives understanding mm -hmm. unto the simple. And you know, when you give light to somebody, if you're in a dark room, you can't perceive very much that's going on. Even if it's a dimly lit room, you can't see things and you might get the wrong impression about what something looks like. But when light comes, that enables mm -hmm. you to see clearly. And the yeah. Word of God brings light to you. Psalms 119, God's Word is a lamp unto my feet and a a light under my feet and a lamp under my path, or mm -hmm. I think I messed that up. A lamp into my feet and a light into there my path. There you go. <laughs> All right. And so anyway, <laughs> if you were trying to walk somewhere and if you didn't, if you couldn't see where you was going, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of time till you're going to trip or fall over something. And so it's the same thing. The way that you keep your relationship vibrant is to be in the Word and meditate. And God will speak to you through the Word of God. Yeah. I spent I don't know, a couple of hours today just having God 
bring light to me and mm -hmm. speak to me through the Word of God. And I've been doing this for 54 years, day and night, and I, I'm addicted to it. I yeah. still have to have it. Yeah. You do too. I do too. So let me ask this. So uh, Clement asked this on YouTube, says, why do I always see the law, do's and don'ts, whenever I read the Word uh, of question instead of the grace my Lord and Savior has given me. So it's because you've been programmed. <laughs> you've been programmed to see it as a legalistic, you've got to do this. And there are a lot of things in the Word that says specifically that. In the mm -hmm. Old Covenant, the reason God gave the law wasn't so that you could keep it and thereby earn His favor, but rather God gave you such an impossible standard to keep that it would condemn you and show you that you hadn't got a chance of earning God's favor. You just have to throw yourself on the mercy of God and say, Oh Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Mm -hmm. That was the purpose of the law. But most people twist it and say that, No, God gave these commands so that you could keep them all. And if you don't keep them, then instead of the blessing comes the wrath. In order to properly divide the Word of God, you need to understand the new covenant he, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 says, We have a better covenant established upon better promises. And you've got to understand the grace. It says in uh, John chapter 1 that the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And so you've got to understand the new covenant. And most people have not been taught the new covenant. Mm -hmm. Most religion is teaching the old covenant laws of rejection, punishment, curses, mm -hmm. and things like this. So this is really what my whole ministry is about. If you would go to our website, we have 200,000 hours of free teaching. And if you would get that teaching that Carrie mentioned here on spirit, soul, and body, I guarantee you it'd help you. Then mm -hmm. the true nature of God, it would really help you. You've already got it. It would really help you. The Righteousness series, that would make a... I've just got, I've got hundreds yeah. of teachings on this. So uh, one of the questions is, um, Malcolm asked this, do I need to be aware of my limiting beliefs in order to get rid of them, or do I just focus on the Word? Do you need to be aware of what you've been rainwashed in, or do you just put yourself in the Word? It's both. You have to, you have to, in a sense, it's like a tsunami. It has to come and overwhelm your previous doctrines. Mm -hmm. And so you get that by just focusing on the truth. But as you focus on the truth, all of these wrong concepts that you've been taught will come to the surface and you're going to have to deal with them. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to sit there and consciously take those thoughts captive. Yeah. Like for instance, I was taught that God doesn't do miracles today. And so when I started studying the Word, when I had this encounter with the Lord, when I experienced miracles, immediately I thought, no, He does do miracles, <laughs> but I still had to deal with this doctrine. So what does it say? And I had to go to the Word of God and find out that there hasn't ever been an end to miracles, that God is still the same yesterday, today, and forever, Hebrews chapter 13. And so I had to, I had to focus on who God was and what He had, but at the same time, I had to confront those false doctrines and mm -hmm. scripturally answer them and put those things to rest. So it's both. That's good. So Leah asked this, and I think this is where a lot of people are. They say, how can I keep myself stirred up in these truths and not fall back into my flesh and carnality when I'm surrounded by ungodliness all day long and can't seem to make the time I need for God and His Word? Well, I think there's a twofold answer to that. The first part is don't let yourself be surrounded all day long okay. by carnality and unbelief. And I know that you may be in a situation like with a work or marriage that you may not be able to just 100% break away, but many people are in situations where they go to a church that's dead and it's countering their faith, you could solve that problem by finding you a good church. You have friends around you that mm -hmm. are not blessing you. They're dragging you down. And many times we sit there and tell ourselves, but I've got to reach these people. Well, yes, it's nice to reach out to people, but if they are impacting you more yeah. than you're impacting them, there is a time for you to leave them and go on. I had to make those decisions yeah. in my life. Have you ever had to do that and break away? Oh, yeah. I think that's the thing. It says evil communication corrupts good manners. So it's just like, again, you're getting all this negativity and opinions and comparison and 
of every, everybody, and you're going to have to you're going to have to make a decision of what path you're going to walk on. So you need to be so committed to the truth that you're willing to make changes to get out of that unbelief. But you can't leave unbelief 100 percent. We are in a fallen world, yeah. and so ultimately, the ultimate answer to that question is you are going to have to just focus on the Word of God. I was in Vietnam and there was a lot of ungodliness around me. I actually was in a transient bunker for a while. I think it was a number of weeks. And they wallpapered the, the ceiling and the walls with nude pictures of women. <laughs> and so here I was in Vietnam trying to keep my mind on the Lord. And I mean, everywhere I looked, there was just temptation. And I literally stuck my nose in the Bible like this. And I wouldn't even put it down to think about something because of what I'd see. I just... And my point is, I was able to keep my mind stayed upon God yep. in the midst of total ungodliness. And as far as I knew, I was the only Christian around. There were no other Christians except the ones that I introduced to the Lord. And so I know by experience that if you are determined, yep. you can do it. It takes effort, and most of us just aren't willing to put the effort into it that it uh, takes. But it's a life and death matter keeping your mind stayed on the Lord. Yeah. Isaiah 26, 3, the Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusteth in him. So yeah. as much as you can, get rid of the unbelief. Turn off the television, except my program. <laughs> but what, get rid of the unbelief and the ungodliness. Get rid of the bad news. Yeah. Get rid of all the social media that's messing you up. Leave those dead churches and don't let the door hit you on your way out. Mm -hmm. Withdraw yourself from people that are dragging you down but ultimately, you're going to have to just focus on the Word of God and let something else go. And if you'll do that, it'll work. And when people tell me that they don't have time for the Word, guys, you make time for what's important to you. That's right. You always can find the time. And if that's getting up earlier or going to bed later or cutting something out of your day, I have found that there is always time. And then once you get into it, it actually develops a hunger. Yeah, people say, I don't have time to go to the doctor until you get sick. Mm -hmm. I don't have time for the dentist until your tooth's hurting and all of a sudden your priorities change. Yeah. You know what? If mm -hmm. you were to see things properly, you don't have time not to get into the Word of God because yeah. Satan is out to destroy us. And if you don't spend time keeping your mind stayed on the Word of God, I guarantee you Satan is going to take advantage of it. So Amen. you got to do it. Amen. That's really good. Well, we ran out of time, so please join us tomorrow morning, Wednesday morning. We have another live Bible study. We love having you join us, and you can bring in more questions. And so thank you guys for being with us tonight. And don't forget that we have people on our phones 24-7, and you mm -hmm. can call, and you can not only receive prayer, but, you know, some of these uh, teachings that I mentioned, mm -hmm. our prayer ministers know all of my teachings. They have a computer with yeah. everything there. You could tell them whatever your need is. Amen. And I guarantee you, whatever your problem is, we've got some teaching from <laughs> God's Word that will lead you to the answer. Amen. So please call, receive prayer, get materials. It will be a blessing to you.